Hello, my name is Katie and welcome to the first video of my channel. Now, I love a good story and British history is packed full of true stories that would really rival the latest Netflix thriller. This story that I'm going to tell you about today is real and it happened not that long ago. So let me tell you about a lady who lived not far from me in the south of England. Her name was Alice Lyle and she is best known as the last woman to be beheaded in England. Alice had a very privileged upbringing. She was the daughter of Sir White Beckinsaw and Edith Bond, and she lived in a sprawling manor house called Moyles Court in the heart of the New Forest. I had the pleasure of visiting the house recently, and today, 500 years later, the house is a private school. The thing that I found most interesting was that the school has an extensive underground warren of tunnels that lead away from the house, and walls that I am assured would be perfect for priest holes. But in 2023, the only things that use the tunnels are colonies of bats. But who knows what the tunnels were originally used for and by whom? Anyway, back to Alice. 500 years ago, a young British girl in the midst of her family and under a certain amount of pressure. So in the 1600s, there was a lot of pressure for girls from Alice's background to marry well to a financially secure man. And marry well, Alice did. Before her 20th birthday, Alice married an up-and-coming lawyer named John Mile. John was the son of wealthy landowners, and Alice, who was herself to jointly inherit Moyle's court, was not badly off either. It's safe to assume that, together, they would be very comfortable financially. Now, to understand how all those years ago, in leafy Hampshire, a couple's life story became the stuff of utter nightmare, we need to understand what was occurring in the country at the time. The English Civil War is over and King Charles I has been beheaded. And here we do have to have a quick chat about the English Civil War. This was a war that ultimately resulted in the deaths of over 200,000 people. It was fought between King Charles I and Parliament. There were lots of reasons the parliamentarians were not great fans of the King. Namely, they didn't like his economic policy and they also didn't like the way he practiced his religion, which was with a lot more pomp and circumstance compared to the way they preferred their religion, which was simpler, plainer. I could go on, but that's all you need to know for this story. Following his defeat in the Civil War, the King was put on trial for treason, found guilty and sentenced to be beheaded. The country became, in essence, a republic under the rule of Oliver Cromwell. He was known as the Lord Protector, not the King. John, Alice's husband, held several high positions in Cromwell's government, and importantly, he was a commissioner during the King's trial. He actively voted against continuing negotiations with the King, and following the King's beheading, John was rewarded with illustrious promotions, and John, Alice, and their family became well-known parliamentarians. Oliver Cromwell was known to be a Puritan in his religion, and he and his supporters were very restrained in their lifestyle choices. In line with Cromwell and his supporters' beliefs, the whole population had to get on board with this new way of life. People as a whole became much more restrained in their habits, playing music, visiting theatres, even eating too much food and drink. Basically, extravagance of any description was frowned upon. Religious festivities like Christmas and Easter no longer occurred as they used to. However, Oliver Cromwell did not live to enjoy his position as head of state for long. He died in his sleep five years later and was succeeded by his son, Richard. But Richard was not good at running the country. He lacked both the political and leadership experience required in the role. He was opposed by royalists and republicans alike, and one thing led to another and he resigned as Lord Protector. Calls began for the return of the king the return of King Charles to the throne. As the eventual restoration of the monarchy began to look ever more likely, the stress and the anxiety levels of Cromwell's original supporters must have been through the roof. Their previous actions had led to the arrest for treason and subsequent execution by beheading of the king's father. Soon the calls for the return of the executed king's son became an avalanche, and in 1660, Charles I's son, Charles II, returned to his country, and it must be noted here, to no significant opposition, he was restored to the throne and became king. Now, John Alice's husband had seen the writing on the wall. 
and perhaps unsurprisingly, he'd done a runner and fled the country, leaving Alice pregnant with their eighth child. John had to keep on the move, but eventually he settled in the beautiful cathedral city of Lausanne in Switzerland. But by August 1664, John's time was up. Whilst John attended a church service, a group of men lay in wait and shot and killed Alice's husband. Let's take a moment to think of poor Alice. Your husband, father of your eight children, and previously a well-respected and high-status individual, has just been assassinated. Your upstanding reputation is now in tatters, and you are on the wrong side of not only public opinion, but perhaps more concerningly, the wrong side of the king. Alice must now bring up her children and fight to maintain her lands and states by herself. She does, by all accounts, also spend time holding clandestine meetings at Moyle's court. These were with other people who shared her non-conformist religious beliefs. During the 20 year period following the restoration of the monarchy, non-conformists like Alice were subject to punishments for holding meetings. Their ministers even prevented from entering certain towns. So holding meetings in your home was an insanely risky business. The pivotal moment that would seal Alice's fate and lead to her walking to her death from out of the window of what is today a very lovely pub in Winchester was yet to come. Alice, now approaching her 70th birthday, was about to be in a world of trouble. And here's why all this political stuff suddenly becomes very personal to an elderly woman named Alice. King Charles II's brother, James II, was now on the throne. He was openly Catholic, which was a problem for a lot of the population at the time. But luckily for the haters, King Charles had had a son with someone other than his wife. Naughty boy. This son, James, Duke of Monmouth, was a Protestant and lived in Holland. He sailed over to England in 1685 in a bid to take the throne from his uncle, King James, through invasion. Monmouth was beaten soundly at the Battle of Sedgemoor, near Bridgewater in Somerset. Over 1,300 of his supporters were killed that day, and Monmouth was taken to London and beheaded on Tower Hill, an area today within the borough of Tower Hamlets. Following the defeat of James, Duke of Monmouth, two of his supporters, one, Richard Nelthorpe, and another, a non-conformist minister named John Hicks, managed to evade capture, fleeing into the surrounding countryside. Scared and desperate, the two of them hid during the day at the home of a man named James Dunn, but he made them go outside at night because that was when the authorities were most likely to raid. The two of them knew they couldn't remain long, they had to keep moving, and John knew just the right place. A journey on foot of nearly 90 miles, trying to avoid being seen and with nothing but what they had on their backs, can't have been easy but they made it eventually to seek shelter at Moyles Court in Hampshire, the home of John's friend, you guessed it, Alice Lyle. They arrived under cover of darkness where they were welcomed, given food and a place to sleep. However, apparently they had not been secretive enough. The authorities had been alerted to their journey and their intended destination. And the following morning, Alice's home was raided. The men, Richard and John, were discovered hiding in the house, one of them even hiding inside of a chimney. Maybe they didn't know about the tunnels? Mm -hmm. Alice's time as a free woman was up. Alice had no lawyer for direction or support, and she was on trial for her life, her alleged crime being treason, something which many people before her had already lost their heads for. Just for good measure, she was at the mercy of a judge better known far and wide as either the Hanging Judge or Bloody Judge Jeffreys. According to Anthony Whitaker's book, The Regicide's Widow, Alice was now suffering from hearing loss, to the extent that she couldn't hear what was going on in her trial. She had to have someone whispering to her the whole time just so she could know what was going on. Alice was shown no humanity by the judge, and there was no allowance of frailty of any sort. Alice, in her defence, said that she knew John Hicks, but had never met or knew of his companion, Richard Nelthorpe. She said that she believed they were in need of shelter because of the non-conformist beliefs the men held. 
She continually, throughout the trial, denied knowing that the men she had given shelter to had taken any part in the Monmouth Rebellion, a rebellion that she emphasised she did not support. Alice was found guilty of treason when she returned to court for sentencing the following day. She was sentenced to be burnt at the stake. After public outcry, because I assumed that the burning to death of a 70 year old woman was just not acceptable even in those times, the king commuted her sentence to death by beheading, which, in the face of it, doesn't seem great, but it was seen as a mercy. Alice spent the last night of her life in an upper room of the building that is now the Eclipse Inn. The site of her execution was just feet away from the inn, and local legend has it that she spent her last night on this earth, kept awake all night, listening to the sound of hammers. Hammers driving nails into the scaffold that was being built for her execution the following day. As the time of her execution drew close, Alice was instructed to climb out of the tiny first floor window and onto the scaffold on the 2nd of September 1685. Sources are conflicted about whether Alice delivered her final words from the scaffold or wrote them down prior to her death, but either way her moving last words have survived and I will leave a link in the description box below where you can go and read these moving final words. But in summary, she spoke ultimately of forgiveness. To me, this trial would seem more like an attempt to put Alice on trial for her husband's role in the downfall of the king and for her non-conformist views. Alice was found guilty of treason when her sole crime seems to have been giving Christian shelter to two men that she believed were being hounded for their religious beliefs. I don't know about you, but I think this story should be in the history books, and I hope by making this film today, more people will come to hear of Alice Lyle, the last woman beheaded in England.